Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to this first IEEE Electron Device Society and Solid State Circuit Society's joint initiative to celebrate the 75 years of the transistor. Today, we have with us Dr. Voila from Access Instruments, Precision Amplifiers. This particular lecture is part of the commemorative lectures which is being organized uh, by the IEEE Electron Device Society in New Delhi, India, uh, along with the India Lopadhyay College, University of Delhi, and the ages of the Department of Biotechnology's Star College program, and the National Academy of Sciences India, Delhi chapter, where the National Academy of Sciences India is the oldest science academy of India. Uh, at the New Delhi, India, we are also celebrating the 48th IEEE New Delhi Sections Foundation Day this is a 15 day event. And this particular webinar is also dedicated to the IEEE Delhi Section. Now, Dr. Voila received her MS degree in electrical engineering from University of Arizona in 1989. She joined the Texas Instrument Incorporated, formerly Burdown Corporation, in 1998 and has been working as an analog IC design engineer and manager at various locations, including Arizona, Texas, as well as Erling and Friesen in Germany. She has elected a distinguished member technical staff in 2018, and her work focuses on precision signal conditioning, including instrumentation, programmable gain amplifiers, power amplifiers, industrial drivers, as well as magnetic-based current sensors and precision magnetic. He has design experience in CMOS, the high voltage CMOS precision bipolar and DCD processes, and has led multiple technologies, circuit co developments, and design key enabling IPs on these new process nodes. He has several IEEE publications and holds 18 patents related to this work with several applications depending. He serves on the technical program committee of ESSCIRC and the ISSC as a Solid State Circuit Society webinar committee member and also on the ISSCC European Region Leadership Team. With these words, I invite Voila to kindly join us and deliver a talk on transistor diversity looking beyond CMOS to improve the analog. Over to you, Voila. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Just take a second to. Yeah, so thank you for having me for this talk. The title of my talk um, is Transistor Diversity. And as it was mentioned, I work with precision amplifiers and, and directly in this area. It is very nice to see that even though CMOS is all around us, some of these earlier transistor types that I will be talking about today can still bring some differentiation in certain application areas and we'll touch upon today. So the outline of my talk is the main goal I have is to share my fascination about these little transistor devices that changed and continuously change our world. I will give a little brief history of the transistor revolution I will focus on amplifiers for two particular reasons. For one, because this is what I'm most familiar with. And two, that in amplifiers, individual transistors still have the spotlight. They still shape the characteristics of the amplifier. So I think it is a good circuit to explore the differences between transistors. I will go through a little bit of history and talk about the discovery and the operating principle and generally the evolution of bipolar, super beta bipolar and JFET devices. And then we'll take a look at a couple of plots to try to determine which transistor is the best for an amplifier. And of course, there is a question mark because there is no simple answer to that question. I think the way it will work is you able to um, put some questions in a chat and uh, Professor Saxena will um, read them off or share with me at the end, and we can um, discuss some of the answers to those questions. But let's dive in. Um, 
ever since electricity was harnessed and actually put into some useful work, we have been striving to control it one way or another. And already the early telecommunication systems, um, they did this by electromechanical relays. They used uh, those to be able to control the current flow between two terminals. And these were, of course, very powerful. And you already had telecommunication systems that were built with these operating principle. They were large, and they had some very power hungry and had, had some reliability issues. Um, also, semiconductor materials and just the principle was already discovered in the 19th century. And namely, they noticed that um, electric conduction was actually increasing over temperature as opposed to general conductors. So the principle was well known and it was understood that these materials could be interesting for um, to create solid state, uh, like uh, some kind of relay based devices. But not until the 20th century, it was actually achieved first, um, before we even got there, the sort of important um, discovery in the early 20th century was of course, first the diode and then the triode vacuum tube. And these devices, significantly smaller in size, enabled the manipulation of the current through a third terminal. And because of that, they, and they were also able to manufacture it in, in a pretty large quantities and reasonably reliably. And they were used as a basis of many electronic devices. Of course, they were still reasonably large. They still were power hungry and they had some reliability issues. So the research towards semiconductor materials have continued. The original principles were already described, but um, generally surface states and the problem of surface states have um, prevented um, the actual real uh, illustration of this until in 1947, of course, the point contact transistor was discovered. And we'll talk about these devices a little bit more in depth later. But of course, it's very important for us because this really marks the discovery of the transistor. And this is what we are celebrating today. And of course, after that, progress was very, very quick. The next year already, the bipolar junction transistor was revealed, then the first integrated circuit, then the first MOSFET devices, and these have moved on very quickly. I think it's also interesting to note here that the word transistor is actually derived from a trans resistance amplifier, and it was given to them early bipolar transistors in the lab. It's nice to see a couple of pictures along with these words. So here on picture number one, I'm showing these electromechanical relays. This is from the 19th century. Then the first vacuum tube. This is, uh, I think, a triode device from Audion. Then, of course, the first point contact transistor. We'll talk about how this was actually constructed in a little bit later. Then one of the early integrated circuits which already contained a couple of transistors. And where we are today, I think the latest um, advancement released was Apple's M1 contains up to 114 billion transistors. And really, if you see how the size of these have gone down over years, it has gone down multiple decades. So since the discovery of CMOS, its ability to be shrunk has been fueling electrification all around us. Um, each of us carry many, many of these transistors um, to every aspect of our life. And the number of transistors that can be included in a square millimeter of chip has been steadily increasing, even though it's becoming more and more difficult to actually manufacture them. And by now, we have features significantly smaller than the wavelength of um, visible light. Um, so the state of lithography has been advancing continuously, and we've been able to fuel this 
miniaturizations over the years um, that you see here on the left. And it's even more telling to take a look what these have enabled. If you look at an example of the ENIAC, which um, was a vacuum tube based computer back in 1946, it took up 1800 square foot. It was created out of 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighted 50 tons. Nowadays, if you look at the world's smallest computer, and of course there is some debate of what truly is considered a computer, but most sources either point to the University of Michigan's chip or the IBM chip. Both of these are smaller than a square millimeter and able to pack similar kind of functionality into these very, very tiny devices. And yeah, of course, the scalability of CMOS has been a driving force. And if you look at some sources last year, there have been 10 to the 34 transistors in the world, and most of these are MOSFET devices. Um, these devices are highly scalable, and because of that, are able to take a lot of the functionality around there. Um, when I started my career was at Burbran, and at the time we were just moving from bipolar base circuits to the CMOS. So actually my first design was a CMOS instrumentation amplifier, which we believe was one of the early ones in industry. And over the years I've moved on, of course, worked with CMOS circuits, but more recently have been also working on bipolar and more specifically precision bipolar circuits. So I became very fond of these devices and um, just generally the history of them. So this is what I would like to share with you today. And I think it will be interesting to take a look at how some of these early type of transistors still are relevant in some of the circuits that we are working with today. So really I'm going to talk about today is the 0.1% or even less percent of the devices that we see around us in integrated circuits. That was a very nice uh, plot that was put together by my colleague from Infineon and that's really speaks out to explain when would we go to more advanced type three, five compound semiconductors or advanced bipolar technologies versus CMOS. And we can look at it two ways. We can of course look at things in terms of performance. And it's well known that um, RF performance is really superior if you look at the three, five uh, compound semiconductor category. So some places where this is the best performance is needed, these transistors are of course still being used. If you look at mixed signal performance, you need transistor performance as well as um, functionality and multiple and some level of integration. So the mixed signal performance is really the highest in some of the silicon germanium nodes that um, exist uh, in industry today. But if you're looking for the cost competitiveness, of course, it's impossible to compete with the level of integration um, that's been achieved with CMOS. So I think from the first performance standpoint, um, that explains the story quite well. And my colleague established two rules which tend to be quite um, relevant in industry is, and rule number one is if something can be done in silicon, eventually it will be done in silicon. So if the more complex compound semiconductors do not bring the needed advantage, then it will, you will be um, advised to go and work on silicon nodes. And rule number two is if a performance can be done in CMOS, eventually it will be done in CMOS because of the cost competitiveness is really the driving force there. But we still find that for some devices, um, the benefits um, outweigh the scalability. And of course, there is an other question here. Can anything eventually stop the scaling of CMOS? And I know that you had some 
lectures more on the progression of CMOS and the new type of transistor types that are um, emerging even as we speak today. And that's not the direction I would like to talk about today. There is another force and that's effectively just the electric field or the strength of the electric field. And this is reasonably simple. Um, as, as we're getting down to sub my or I guess single nanometer processes, you have oxide thicknesses on a scale of a couple of nanometers. But in silicon dioxide, the maximum electric field that we can um, we can withstand is something between 0 0.8 to 1 kilovolt per micrometer. If you're looking at the maximum electric field in just the bulk silicon, of course, this will be somewhat doping dependent, but it's something like 50 volts per micrometer. So that really means that you are limited by the electric field in, in these cases. And this is what leads to nanometer technologies are all operating sub one volt. And you know what happens if we are not observing some of these limitations? Of course, electrical overstress, and I'm sure most of you have experienced um, this in the lab or working with semiconductor devices. I think what's important to note that at the same time as we have undergone this incredible scaling of integrated circuits and CMOS, our world has not shrank, of course, luckily, at, at the same rate. So many of the things we need to measure, many of the disturbances around us, and some of the actuators that we need to drive, those still require high voltages. So if you're actually looking at just a very simplistic signal chain representation that I'm showing here in a plot, you will still find that some of the amplifiers that tend to be at the beginning of the signal chain or the driving amplifiers at the end of the signal chain those still need the higher supply voltages. Then of course, you go to data converters, those operate at somewhat lower voltages and all of the digital processing, signal processing, those tend to be at the very, very aggressive low supply voltage nodes. If you of course look at just the general supply voltage and how it tends versus the transistor um, scaling, you of course find that to be able to handle larger supply voltages, you need to have larger transistors. So this is really one area where the scaling of CMOS alone does not provide benefits. And this is also the area where you will find some of these early transistors still excelling due to some of their analog performance that they offer. So just going to take a short detour and talk um, about the history of operational amplifiers. The first patent for vacuum tube op amp was registered in 1941, reasonably late if you already considered that there were computers being made from vacuum tubes, not shortly after this. Of course, the first transistor and the first commercial silicon transistors were introduced in 19. 47 and 1954, uh, respectively. And the commercially available vacuum tube op amp was also available about the same time. You have, then things moved on also for operational amplifiers quite quickly. You already find the first discrete IC op amp in 1961. Of course, quite a few other companies, including my um, my first company I worked for, Burr Brown, have followed very shortly after that. And uh, the first monolithic op amp was already introduced in 1963. Currently, as, as much as I know, one of the smallest commercially available amplifiers are from Texas Instruments were introduced. Um, and these are barely larger than just a speckle of a salt. So not quite as impressive as the progress in computers but amplifiers have also progressed very nicely due to um, the advances that we are talking about today. And really, just if we talk about amplifiers, um, of course, we all know that we are looking for a device that has large input impedance and basically does not disturb whatever it's trying to measure. 
we're looking for a device that has infinite gain and bandwidth. So basically there is no delay through this amplifier and something that is able to drive larger currents and voltages on the output. So it has a low output impedance. So we want to achieve amplification without introducing any kind of errors or any kind of delays or distortion. And this is important because it's really set the signal chain quality of what we are able to measure. And due to some of the stability requirements, we are only able to use very few gain stages. Most amplifiers use two to three. And because of this, a very few transistors eventually end up determining the overall amplifier performance. So if our input should have no noise, it needs to have the high impedance, they have to be perfectly matched to um, create a low offset and not sensitive to temperature or supply voltage or common mode these few transistors really have to do some heavy lifting. And of course, on the output side, we want to be able to uh, have reasonably high power and low impedance. So again, those transistors in the output stage shape the performance very strongly. So next, let's go back a little bit in history and, and talk about these transistors and, and just generally their origin. So, in 1947 marked the year of the introduction of the point contact transistor, which is a little bit different than of course the bipolar junction transistor that we are most familiar with. What was the driving force for this research? As we talked about, vacuum tubes were working very great. They um, had excellent signal processing capabilities, but they were large, very power hungry, and were difficult to manufacture and also suffered from reliability through operation. So they had to be exchanged quite often. Eventually the goal was to create a semiconductor devices that can control the current flow between two terminals. And the field effect transistor was already proposed in 1926, but uh, surface charges eventually prevented any kind of practical implementations. And, and these were also significant challenge at Bell Labs for Bardeen and Britain. Um, and this is one of the things they were able to address to demonstrate their first transistors. If you look, um, the first implementation here in the upper right is, the, the breakthrough was is they've taken an N-type germanium silicon or <laughs> N-type germanium semiconductor they had a very thin layer of P-type material on the top, and they grounded um, this semiconductor slab, and, and that grounding is effectively what you could call the base of this transistor. They needed to create two golden contacts into this semiconductor very closely spaced apart, and that they achieved with a plastic wedge where they put a gold foil on it, and they just cut it with a razor blade to be able to place these two point contacts to something like 50 micrometer apart of each other. Then they of course bias these two contacts that they now became available. One of them slightly higher than the base and the other one significantly lower than the base. And this way they were able to demonstrate almost 20 dB power gain when they actually looked at, at the collector side. And how this transistor actually physically operates, there are different kinds of uh, implementations or descriptions for this. And, and I think even the inventors themselves had a debate exactly through that complete operation mechanism. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it full justice, but, but I will try. It's effectively um, through the emitter, metal um, semiconductor junction. Of course, holes are become um, available at the emitter junction. And these holes can eventually take two paths. Of course, they can take a path through this very narrow layer of p semiconductor material at the surface, but some of them will have actually enough um, energy to also uh, to already diffuse because of course the forward by junction to refuse through the base and, and, and it takes a parallel path. And 
by modulating the voltage on the emitter node, they were able to control the current flow that is available at the collector. Of course, the collector is a reasonably high impedance node, and because of that, that was actually a power gain of this transistor. Uh, these particular transistors eventually actually went into production at multiple companies, and you could still you could find them in hearing aids, oscillators, some, some telecommunication devices. And because of these shallow junctions and the emitter, they actually were quite excellent in terms of speed compared to some of the other type of transistors. And you know, as I mentioned, already Shockley and Britain had different explanation on the physical mechanism of the current control in point contact transistors. And Shockley developed, based on these discussions, a bipolar junction theory that he was able to demonstrate the year after that. And this is really the transistor most of us are familiar with and, and basically the theory that we are still using for bipolar junction transistors. This was more of a sandwich structure with an end slab, an end dope, a P dope, and then again an end dope type of semiconductor. Again, the PN junction was forward bias that allowed um, electrons to eventually diffuse from the emitter into the base, diffuse the base, and be swept into the collector. Um, but it still had the issues that it required three semiconduct, three reasonably pure semiconductor devices sandwiched together, and that was difficult to manufacture. And at that time, we just did not have the availability of pure enough and uniform semiconductor material, materials. Steele, at the time still at Bell Labs, demonstrated a grown transistor where he's able to was able to show that you can grow a transistor just starting with a single crystal seed and was able to introduce the doping just by introducing pellets of impurities during this uh, growing process. And at that time, Bell Labs has done something interesting that really shaped what we have today is they chose to license this technology to 40 different companies in 1952. They gave all of these companies the crystal seeds to start their own semiconductor manufacturing and they gave basically effectively a cookbook of how to make these devices. And I think this really led to the very, very rapid improvements that we have been able to see uh, right, right from that moment when, when this was shared with the rest of the community. Um, I work for Tesla's Instruments, so of course um, we'll take a little bit of Texas Instruments history into this lecture. Um, and of course, you know, they were one of the companies um, that were interested in, in the licensing of semiconductors and, and they really set in this direction um, at that time. And they also recognized that to make semiconductors um, available to everyone, we need to demonstrate it in an application that people can relate to. And that application was chosen to be the first transistor-based pocket radio that became available. In, I think in 1954, they collaborated with another company called Regency Division of um, Industrial Development Engineering Associates. And they were tasked to develop a circuit, a radio that was using these transistor circuits. But of course, because transistors are very, very expensive at the time, they were driven to come up with a circuit that used the least amount of transistors possible. And after a couple of iterations. I think they originally started out with six transistor radio. The engineers were pushed to optimize it down to four transistor radio, which you see the semi or the actual schematic up here today. And this went into production with germanium based transistors. But of course, I think we all know that even though germanium was, was the um, base of the first transistor devices, we're not talking about germanium valley, but we talk about silicon valley. And um, I think it's interesting to take a look at why. Of course, the first transistors were based on germanium and germanium brings some advantages. These are easier to grow because it has a lower melting temperature. 
but because of its lower band gap voltage, it has pretty high leakage and a very significantly reduced performance of high temperature. And they suffer from thermal runaway, a positive feedback that can very quickly um, destroy a bipolar transistor. I think even engineers very early had realized that silicon had the theoretical promise to improve all of these, but there were some significant manufacturing challenges um, that prevented silicon transistors. And the story goes, and I found it a very interesting story, is um, Gordon Peel, who has moved to Texas Instruments at that time, actually brought um, to a conference in 1954 a radio that was created using silicon transistors. And his talk was one of the later ones. So after a full day of discussing all of the challenges and why silicon transistors couldn't be manufactured, he was able to pull out this transistor radio out of pocket, just like the transistor radio we talked about the previous, but with the germanium transistors replaced by silicon transistors. And he was able to demonstrate with a hot pot of oil that if he dropped the germanium based transistor radio into that, it stopped working using silicon transistors, the radio continued to work. And, and that really marked them, um, silicon transistors making it into industry. Why is silicon better than germanium? Of course, you know, one important consideration, it, it's based on a very abundantly available starting material. And very importantly, it's very too easy to grow a high quality dielectric on top of it, which is of course silicon dioxide and most of our devices strongly utilize this. It has good thermal properties, which continue to be very important even today as we are placing more and more power into our small circuits. It can be manufactured with low defectivity and it offers enough mechanical stability to create wafers. But of course, it has one significant disadvantage, which is the low carrier mobility or a lower carrier mobility than germanium. You know, this is a very, very, very basic slide. So I'm just going to go through it at a quick pace. And I'm hoping I'm not going to get myself lost in it. Is, But the basic operation of the bipolar junction transistor, just as we talked about, is we have a heavily doped emitter in most cases, and the electrons are injected into a moderately doped base in a for, through a forward bias uh, PN junction. And eventually they of course diffuse through this narrow base region, and we want to make the base region narrow because we want to avoid most of these electrons to recombine, which effectively would turn into base current, which is effectively lowers um, the input impedance of, of this um, device. And then when they actually get to the um, base collector junction due to the large electric field, they are swept into the collector and eventually rise of the collector current that is of course opposite of the electric flow, the electron flow. Um, collectors are typically lightly doped um, mostly to avoid the variation that you would have through this reverse bias junction through to the voltage, which effectively would um, reduce the output impedance of these transistors. As we talked about, sandwich structures had their own manufacturing challenges. So the more common implementation of the transistor is, of course, a diffused base transistor, which I'm showing a simplified um, cross section here at the bottom. So once we moved from germanium point contact transistors to the germanium grown junction transistors, eventually to silicon, things taken off very quickly. So here I am showing to the left from my colleague uh, from analog devices, the progression of the class of transistors around the 30 volt um, range. It is very difficult if you try to combine advances, different voltage levels and, and other parameters. So I normalized it to the breakdown voltage of something around 20 to 30 volts. And you see the progress of different technologies emerging. So 
Of course, the first important step was that it fused transistors back at the time, be primarily dependent on NPN transistors with lateral PMPs being available, but somewhat um, lower speed or significantly lower speed and um, reduced capabilities. Then um, about 10 years later, we've seen the junction isolated um, technologies with by now um, um, both NPN and PMP devices available at a similar kind of speed. In the 1990s, silicon and um, SOIs, so silicon isolator processes and polyemitters became available. These have given significant speed advantage to these bipolar transistors. And just most recently over the last 15, 20 years, silicon germanium. So we find a way to bring back germanium into the transistors to really excel on the terms of speed capabilities of these devices. So if we actually look at the modern bipolar transistors, and I've taken these images from my colleagues at Georgia Tech and IHP, is these look very, very different than the original devices that we just seen. You see um, that the parasitic capacitances are being controlled by deep trenches being introduced to able to allow us the high voltages without significant amount of parasitic capacitances in these transistors. Um, another significant advan uh, advancement was bringing back germanium in terms of heterojunction um, that are able to um, bring back the improved mobility by introducing germanium into the silic structure, silicon structure. Of course, the germanium also offers a lower band gap and of course the higher carrier mobility. And it's also important to note that these transistors are as complex they are, they still have the compatibility to be um, processed on standard or similar to standard C uh, CMOS processing two steps. And because of that, they could be integrated even with um, some of these um, highly advanced CMOS technologies. The introduction of the polyemitter is, brings us a significantly better control of the junction depth at the emitter. And because of that, of course, again, lower parasitic capacitances and therefore the higher speed. And um, these transistors with all of their speed um, and noise advantages have been already integrated with some 300 millimeter capable technologies. For example, Intel has announced these. Another class of transistors, um, which is effectively just a modification of the bipolar junction transistor is the so-called super beta transistor. We talked about that it's very important, um, you know, transistors bring some great advantage in lower noise, higher speed, but one of the disadvantages, of course, the base current and therefore the reduced um, input impedance. Um, the way to address this is, of course, to optimize these transistors for the highest possible beta and super beta transistors, effectively, that's what they do. They bring the advantage as, of course, our bipolar, general bipolar junction transistors, but they uh, are optimized for the highest current gain by improving the base transit efficiency. This could be, of course, achieved different ways, but in all cases leads to a lower breakdown voltages so in most cases, these transistors have to be cascoded some way or another. They do lower speed a little bit, but not significantly. And um, if you look in literature, they can able to demonstrate current gains up to 5,000, where a good regular bipolar transistor would have something like 100 to 200. So this is a significant advancement and it has been used very strongly in um, input transistors of devices such as the one I'm showing here. Another class of amplifiers, most of you are likely not familiar with the junction field effect transistor. And ironically, the field effect transistors were the, the devices that we originally were looking for when the bipolar junction transistor uh, was discovered. Really, we're looking for a device 
which has two terminals in this case and six transistor source and train and be able to control the current flow between the source and train by modulating uh, a third terminal, which is in a junction. So if a transistor is, is called the gate. Um, so effectively, when, um, when you bias the transistor um, appropriately, you're able to modulate the channel between the source and the trade terminal effectively changing its impedance and therefore changing the current flow between those two terminals. The big significant difference to bipolar transistors is that the gate is high impedance. So there is basically barely any current flow um, going into the gate. It's very similar to what you would expect from a CMOS transistor. But also because of the current flow actually is happening directly in bulk silicon, these transistors tend to be very low noise, especially very low 1 over F noise. So let's take a look at some of those characteristics on, on this plot. So for the most part, if you look at um, train to source current versus train to source voltage, the curves look quite a bit similar to that what you would see on a MOSFET device. With one very big distinction, these devices are depletion mode devices. So with zero voltage on a gain, you already have some current flow. Um, and the other big difference to the CMOS transistors that you like the most familiar with is that the one over F noise corner tends to be at least about 100, maybe 500 times lower than what most CMOS devices of, of this kind of voltage level would offer. And of course, big differentiator to bipolar is that these devices have no gate current, and these can be also easily integrated into most bipolar processes. So which kind of circuits could take advantage of these? I'm just listing a couple here is one of the most um, utilized circuits with JFAT devices is a voltage independent current source that can be made very simply by placing the right value of resistor in series uh, with the source node of a JFAT. Another neat trick that has been applied multiple times is to bootstrap basically or, or create a buffer across a transient, well, basically across a photodiode or some kind of diode at the input of a trans impedance amplifier. By doing this, you are able to reduce the parasitic capacitance and of course, some of the effects of the resistance and therefore can, the overall circuit can be made significantly faster than without this trick. And another place where JFETs have been used extensively is creating over voltage protection at the input of um, some of the devices. Here, you are able to bring the input terminal to significantly higher voltages than the actual internal circuitry by effectively creating a voltage controlled resistor um, using the JFET transistor. Some advantages of, of devices that have been achieved by JFET input amplifiers, high speed, high precision amplifiers, or ultra high speed buffers that have been demonstrated up to multiple gigahertz. So if we were in person, I would want to play a little card game together, but I think it's very difficult to do online. So I will just basically try to deliver the punchline of this exercise is, and that effectively is, let's take a look at these transistors, the bipolar transistor, it's super beta variant, of course, a CMOS transistor we are all familiar with, and the JFET transistor and the power transistor. And let's compare them through some of the most important characteristics. And, and those were, in, in this case, low frequency noise, wideband voltage noise, current noise, their transconductance, the maximum speed they're able to offer, input impedance, their on resistance, and of course, in terms of scalability and matching. And if we do that, and I'm, you know, unfortunately have to jump a couple of slides, 
we see a very clear trend that bipolar transistors tend to excel in terms of noise, especially 1 over F noise, transconductance, generally towards speed, and of course they're matching. And CMOS transistors and JFAT transistors, of course, offer us a significantly better input impedance, significantly lower current noise. Most cases, especially the power variants, have a very low um, on resistance. So when, when we're designing these transistors, of course, we need to take um, all of these into um, account to sort of determine which one um, to use. So if we go through some very basic examples, for example, if you want to do an amplifier input device with a low impedance bridge sensor, low noise and over temperature accuracy, then we very quickly, if they are available, find that the super beta bipolar transistors offer the best advantages in, in this particular case. If we go to a slightly different use case, um, such as a microphone P amplifiers, where input transistors and where the low frequency noise up to 20 kilohertz is very important, but the mic microphone itself would have a high output impedance, then we best serve with JFET amplifiers um, to serve this particular application. If we need a low on resistance, robust and low power switching capability, with low capacitance, as, as you see in many multiplexing capabilities, you will find that CMOS transistors will offer the best advantages in, in this particular use case. And of course, if you go to some of the classics, such as a voltage reference that is independent of temperature, in this class of circuits, we still tend to use bipolar circuits um, most commonly. One of the places that is very strongly being researched today and I, is what is the best transistor if you want to be able to achieve high voltage and high current capabilities. And, you know, I, I think that there are different kinds of um, transistors that, of course, are being explored, IGBTs, gallium nitride, silicon carbide. So this is really an area where we'll the, um, the jury is still out there of, of which transistor type will offer the most manufacturable benefits in, in these applications. So this is an area that will be interesting to see over the next couple of years. So I'm probably going to jump through a couple of slides that are, are very basic, but I, I do want to show you um, one comparison before we go into the um, Q&A session is is, you know, we've talked about these different advantages, and of course, I talked quite a bit about amplifiers as, as a critical circuit for transistor performance. So what I've put together here is comparing different types of amplifiers. So I've taken a JFET trimmed amplifier, a MOS-based amplifier, super beta-based amplifier, trimmed or untrimmed. So basically with factory calibration um, and looked at them at different use conditions, whether we want to measure a lower signal bandwidth, a high signal bandwidth, something with low source impedance or high source impedance, and just taken some kind of normalization factors, you know, which kind of temperature range we're looking at, is the common mode changing or the supply voltage change significantly. So try to look at, okay, let's see which transistor type, so which amplifier is the best, and of course, what you will find is um, there is no single transistor that is best in our condition. So, so in this particular case is if you're looking for low bandwidth, low source resistance, bipolar based amplifiers offer you the lowest errors um, in, in this particular case. But if you go to the absolute use case or the completely opposite use case, for example, a very high bandwidth application with a high source resistance. Due to the base current, the bipolar amplifiers do not perform well anymore. And you actually find either JFET or MOS-based amplifiers to give you the best performance. So I think really the punchline of this talk and this particular slide is 
we cannot say that a single transistor is better than the other just for a particular property. It really depends on the use case. And that's why we see so many different types of amplifiers optimized for different parameters still coexisting and, and bring advantages into the signal chain. And it's really where I would like to conclude uh, my slide today. I'm hoping I was able to give you a little bit of a different perspective than um, the transistors you most likely use on a daily basis. We have um, these early transistor types continue to evolve and still able to provide some differentiation especially in uh, towards high speed and precision signal chain applications. And you see them continue to evolve even as we speak and parallel to the advances that you see in CMOS transistors. And with that, I prepared quite a few um, additional references that um, you are able to um, take a look at if, if you find some of this history interesting and would like to thank you all for your attention today. And also would like to point you to these excellent um, lectures, of course, on the EBS website, as well as um, this history on the computerhistory.org uh, website, where they give you some more background to, um, to the history of transistors and semiconductors in general. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Voila, for explaining right from the very basics to the very advanced. Basically, this must be a very good tutorial, I must say, for anyone who intends to study this as an undergrad or a postgrad level also. And on behalf of the organizers, uh, that is the IEEE EDS LE chapter, along with my co-organizers, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to host this kind of talk through this virtual platform and where I must say that uh, the participation is from all across the globe. And these particular webinars will be recorded and will be shared on the EDS Resource Center for the benefit of all those who uh, due to different time zones, they may have missed out this particular session. Thank you very much, Dr. Baila. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and to organize everything. Sure. And uh, okay. have a nice afternoon. Sure, okay, bye-bye.